If you are ever going to change your brain, the first basic step is changing your perception about it. You must begin to believe that the brain and all of reality can and does change constantly. You can help steer that change yourself rather than just let your brain be blown around by the wind or more likely big business trying to get its hands in your little pockets. And once you learn to see this, your brain health potential becomes exponential. This is episode number four. We were each thrown into this world, into a seemingly random brain, random life. And then we've been told that that's just the luck of the draw. You are who you are. You're either stupid or smart, good at XYZ or bad at it, naturally optimistic or pessimistic, or whatever in between. Anyway, you are what you are, and there's not much you can do about it. Sure, you can improve your brain a little bit here or there by doing this or that, but the hardware itself has already been manufactured, and you can't rebuild it or get a new device. Your brain fate has been sealed. It is what it is, so Go focus on other things like being a good little consumer or worker. Come on, lift your chin up. It's not true. Do not forfeit the game and let yourself be zombified and kicked around and bullied. You can change your brain. You can. How many lives are being destroyed, taken advantage of, and full of pain and sadness because of this fixed mindset about what we are and who we can become? We were once small little children, just lost and confused, searching for an identity, something, anything to hold on to, yet also longing for love and connection. Someone to just see us, to love and accept us, to prove that we exist. We looked up to our parents, teachers, and elders because they looked all powerful, all knowing, and all good. At least some of them did. Plus, we didn't really know anybody else, so we gravitated towards them, treasuring their every word, their every act. They were our original gods, our Bibles. Our trust in them was so powerful that we soaked up everything that they said and did, especially when it came to our own identity, when it came to things so mysterious as our own brain. If they told you you were stupid, you became stupid forever, smart. Lucky you. Good, bad, whatever. It doesn't matter. None of that was true. Whatever supposed fate you were handed, that whole way of thinking was a curse and a lie. I'm not saying that DNA, genetics, and things like brain damage or mental illness don't exist. They super duper do, unfortunately. We each have our own seemingly innate thinking and learning style personality, temperament, level of intelligence, as well as unique backlog of experiences. Talk to your mother, if she's still alive, and she will tell you stories of how you were just exactly the same when you were a baby. Those are some of my favorite stories. Even at the age of 35, I was still asking my mom to retell me what I was like as a baby, partly because I wanted to know myself, still desperate and looking for a reconfirmation of my own identity, to have something to trust and something to hold on to, but also because I can see in her happy face that she also wanted to know and make sense of me too, and herself as a mother. Michael, you were always a quiet baby. You never cried. Even when you were hungry, you were so patient. You were one of the easy ones, and you still are. See? And then your brother. Maybe it's not so surprising that he turned out the way he did. Ah! I was labeled good and smart, and my teachers reinforced that story, whereas some of my siblings got the opposite diagnosis. Same parents, sometimes the same teachers, but what metrics were they even using? The behavior of some baby or four-year-old, the first few frames of a potentially never-ending movie, that's not enough data to determine who someone is. Sometimes the hypothesis given by these supposed experts turns out valid, but oftentimes it does not. Albert Einstein didn't even start talking until he was three years old. His teacher told him he was stupid and would never amount to anything. Steven Spielberg got bullied because he couldn't read so well. Jim Quick, 
not quite as famous as those guys, but it doesn't matter. His teacher would make fun of him in class, calling him the boy with the broken brain in front of all his classmates. And now he's arguably the world's number one brain coach. There are countless stories throughout history of teachers and parents getting it completely wrong. And 99% of these former children will never know about, and likely their lives did not have such a happy ending. So my main point here is your early brain diagnosis is not your destiny. It's like one of those little papers in the fortune cookies. Interesting to look at, but it shouldn't be taken seriously, literally. Ultimately, it just belongs in the trash. Get out a piece of paper and pencil and ask yourself this. What do you believe about your brain? Your intelligence, memory capacity, reading ability, personality, skills. What are you good at? What are you bad at? Are you a good person or a bad person? Happy or sad? After writing down the answers to these questions, next to each answer, write down when you formed that belief about yourself and why. What is the justification or proof for that belief? You might realize that there's not a lot of substance to these beliefs. They're pretty flimsy, not backed by a lot of data and certainly not much quality data. Sure, the reality you're living in might seem to match the beliefs to confirm them because you keep reaffirming them and looking for ways to prove them true. But that's not good science. Instead, what you should be doing, at least if you genuinely want to find the truth about your brain, is to try to falsify them. Find evidence for why they're not true. It's probably not that hard to find, especially if you keep at it. And also because the brain will keep changing and hopefully growing along the way. How often have you even tried to challenge them? How often have you challenged yourself to break out of the boxes that you've built around yourself? This is your homework assignment. Get out there and try to at least a little bit to falsify your damaging, limiting beliefs about your brain. You are no longer a child. So say hello to your inner child, hug him or her, and laugh together at what silly nonsense all that previous talk was. This moment, set yourself free. Set both you and the child free. Let go of the static, fixed, permanent, boxed up vision of reality and rip open a new portal to a new world, a world of unlimited growth and potential. The world that was always there, but you couldn't see because you were always behind a layer of wrapping paper, covering it all up. And then on the back of the wrapping paper were little crayon drawings of the supposed real world and the real you. Crappy drawings that the grown-ups gave you. Flash forward decades and you might still be tied to a chair, staring at some of those same drawings, worshiping them, identifying with them, maybe even having become a more hardened version of them. Punch a hole in those drawings with both fists. Escape your paper house and enter another world, a limitless and ever-changing one where discovery and growth are possible and probable. Sure, that world is more unpredictable, risky, and scary, especially at first, but it is also ultimately more beautiful, meaningful, and fulfilling. Part of the deeper problem might be that you grew up in the West, a culture that is infatuated with nouns and objects. What is it? Who am I? What do I have? Is it good or bad? This will be a little bit of a philosophical tangent, but bear with me. Even if you go back through Western philosophy and religion, you'll notice that these are the same sorts of questions that people were mostly concerned with. We want answers, and we want to carve up the world into individual objects and actions, then stamp labels on them, and just move on to the next item, like we are some kind of weird appraisers or collectors or something. It's an addiction to knowledge and an escape from confusion and ambiguity. 
It makes sense. Sure, it's not just a Western thing. It's a human thing, a language thing. It helps us more easily navigate the world, store memories, and accumulate and share information, communicate with one another. It allows us to take moments in time or slices of reality and push images of them into the future for everyone else to see. That's useful, but also harmful. And why is it harmful? Because when you divide the world up into objects and draw borders between this and that, you disconnect the world. You become blind to the underlying connections between things and disharmonies and conflicts begin to arise. You forget that your body, your brain is constantly linked up to, merged with, and feeding off of the supposed outside world. Everything, though it is technically divisible, is ultimately one. Brains, other brains, food, astronomy, nature, history, everything. Given the way our perceptual apparatuses, our senses, and various systems like the nervous system are designed, we're going to divide up the world. Everything isn't just a big, swirly, chaotic mess. Everything melting into the rest. Though that is what's going on in the background. We just can't see it, usually, or survive in it. Our senses and our languages are something like augmented reality glasses, feeding us a more comprehensible version of the world. That's great, but then you add layers of culture and politics on top of it, and it can get out of control, getting further and further away from the truth, from reality, especially like it has in the West. I myself about to divide up the world in a potentially erroneous and inappropriate way, but things are quite different here in Asia, at least traditionally. I've been here for the past 11 or 12 years, and I feel it. But I also feel it fading away as the world is getting more and more connected and Western ideologies are spreading everywhere through things like the internet and technology in general. Anyway, individual objects in many Asian cultures are less of the focus, and instead, the focus is on the connections and relationships between things. You will have learned about this if you ever took a cultural psychology class or maybe even just traveled around Asia. This partly explains why Asian cultures tend to be more collectivist, often thinking about and identifying with the group, valuing things like peace and harmony, and Western cultures tending to be more individualistic, caring about the individual and valuing things like freedom and independence. Western religions like Christianity and Islam have rules. Actions and people are either good or bad. You're going to heaven or hell. Things are black or white. Obey thy master. You want to know reality? Read this book and it will tell you what reality is. Do not trust your senses. Do not question me. Do not think for yourself. Things get a bit more fluid and water-like in the East. Taoism, for example, is all about perceiving the connectedness and interdependence of all things and living in harmony with nature. Everything is always changing and nothing is permanent. The same is true in Buddhism, and it is by clinging to or desiring these ever-changing, growing, and decaying, temporary, supposed objects in this world that causes us all of our pain. The more you can just let go of your identity, possessions, and embrace the melting interconnection of everything, the happier you will be. Stop fighting reality. Accept it. Even if you look at the languages, the subject or pronoun of the sentence is often dropped altogether or doesn't even exist. You don't need it. Verbs or processes tend to be more emphasized than nouns and objects. And you don't need to speak so directly and literally all the time. People can understand you through the overall context and environment, even with fewer words. Language itself is connected to everything else. The surrounding world and backdrop of culture and history is inherently tied up with language. Nevertheless, with the rise of technology, the internet, globalization, and capitalism, cultures across the world are becoming more and more individualistic. The reality perceived by Taoists and Buddhists is still there, but so many of us are becoming blind to and unable to see it. We're becoming more self-centered, separate, and alone. As my mom was dying, one of the questions I asked her was, what advice do you have for me in my life? 
what do you wish you can say to me that you might not be able to say to me in the future? And what she told me was, you don't want to be alone. And then I asked her, who do you worry about the most in our family? Which of my brothers and sisters do you worry about the most? And she said, this sibling or that sibling. And I said, why? And she answered, because she is alone. Because he is all alone. We need and crave both independence and connection, of course. We're human. That's one of the core battles and drama-creating, but also meaning-creating forces in life. But when you shift too far to one extreme, say you lack connection, problems begin to occur in the body and overall environment. Just look at all the problems on the individual, societal, and global level that we're facing today. Zoom in or zoom out, the bubble is popping. Bring yourself back into a harmonious and playful, healthy relationship with nature and each other. You can keep some of your technology, your man-made things. It is not necessarily bad, nor is nature necessarily always good. But you need to become more aware of the various ways in which each thing or environment is affecting you and how you are also affecting it. Everything snaps back into balance eventually. So slow down Give love to that opposing force that you've been neglecting. Stop thinking of just your own ego, and when things do rebalance, it will be less of an explosion and more like waves gently crashing on the beach. Normally, when we think of the word connection, we immediately just think of connection with other people, friends, family, lovers, other humans. So you might think you are connected. Look at all these people around me and on my social media. I'm connected. Not necessarily. And that's the best case scenario. Many of us don't even have meaningful human connections. We're alone. But the larger point I'm trying to make is that humans are just a tiny sliver of reality. Of course, they're one of the most important slivers, probably the most important since we are mammals, biologically social creatures. However, we need to widen our perception of connectedness to include things like nature and the universe as a whole. I mentioned my brother in episode one. He spends a lot of time hanging out with wild animals and he sleeps out there in nature. That's horrible and dangerous from many metrics. You want to have a home, a bed, basic comfort and safety, but he is tapping into something that most of the rest of us are deeply lacking and needing, connection with the wider non-human parts of reality, nature and the universe. And that's just as or more important. Why am I even talking about all of this? Well, when you believe and perceive that everything is divided up, not connected, each thing separate and definable, you lose your ability to notice the other 80 or 90% of reality. I'm talking about those connections, the things in between. You begin to believe that your body is separate from the rest of the world. Your brain is like a prepackaged toy out of a box just sitting in your head. Therefore, you can just feed it whatever you want or do whatever because it ain't going to make a difference anyway. That thing is rock solid, indestructible, but it's not. Your eyes ears, mouth, and skin. Merge it with the rest of existence. Sure, the skull and certain parts of the body do shield it from many of the things out there, but ultimately, you cannot escape. Your environment is part of you, and everything that you touch, everything through these seemingly invisible connections, changes you, alters you and your brain. Your brain today is not the same brain you had yesterday, and it certainly is not the brain that you had when you were a little child. We now know with epigenetics and neuroplasticity, for example, that the brain continues to grow and change throughout life, and you can deliberately control that change with the right habits and inputs. Granted, it is hard or nearly impossible to reverse or change certain serious brain conditions, but even then, you might as well try, might as well believe you can do it, and give yourself a chance. You just might surprise yourself and get better, perhaps a thousand times better. Have you ever even really tried? Have you ever challenged your limiting beliefs? They don't want you to try. I'm talking about big business, the moolah machine, because as long as you remain ignorant about the fact that such change is possible, very possible, they can keep selling you cures, 
pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, parties, sex, new gizmos and gadgets, creams and lotions, clothes, and just endless junk. That is not helping you. But often just breaking your brain even further, making it even harder for you to see the truth and break free. Perfect. Even easier to manipulate you. You consumer slave, be a good boy. Take this pill forever. Trust me, I'm a doctor. Buy this. I'm your friend. Real sources of health and positive brain change are often very cheap or even free. That's precisely why they don't want you to break out of the hypnotic spell. Then you're useless from a business and money perspective. Ah, unless you become a businessman yourself and help sell these cures and potions to the other remaining fools. It's a freaking pyramid scheme. Entire countries and cultures built on meaningless and useless stuff. No one needs almost any of this stuff or consumerist experiences, really. It's just clogging up our lives, consuming our time and energy, and distracting us from what we actually want. Freedom and control over our own lives. More authenticity, creativity, energy, simplicity, and a deeper connection with and understanding of the rest of reality, both human and non-human. Carol Dweck, in her book Mindset, talked about growth and fixed mindsets. For too long as a culture and individually, especially when it comes to brain health, too many of us have been living in a fixed mindset. On the surface, it looks like we believe in growth. We're going to the gym, exercising, buying supplements, eating healthy, injecting things into our body. So maybe our mindset is improving a little, but it's nowhere near where it could be. And we're still too focused on quick hacks and tools, separate things that will make us better. Looking at the world as a bunch of disconnected parts that magically sometimes influence one another, often not understanding or even caring why, we miss all the rest of the beauty. We cannot see all the hidden connections and therefore cannot see all the disharmonic relationships between so many things, both inside and outside our bodies. These disharmonies are like volcanoes. They may look invisible, blending in with the other mountains in the background on most days. However, when the disharmony builds up and builds up, the pressure getting too tight, those volcanoes explode. Then we can see. Then we wake up. Culture and governments and individuals have to change or they will crumble. We've seen this happen again and again throughout history and it's happening today in many ways again. But more volcanoes will explode. Some so big that it might be the end. There is a mental health epidemic that has spread across the globe and is beginning to spit out lava. This is one of those big volcanoes, the biggest volcano in my opinion, at least on the individual level. When your brain breaks beyond reasonable repair, almost every other area of your life breaks. And then you're homeless, stuck in some hospital, in jail, alone, or dead. It is the saddest thing. And why does it keep happening? It's often just a failure in perception on both an individual and societal level. It's not your fault. Don't blame yourself. We don't have time for blames or regrets. If you want to prevent the big explosion, change the way you think about reality and your own body and identity. Embrace some of those ideas from the East, but also take the best from the West. Shed your old beliefs about yourself and your brain and believe that you can make a better you and you don't need anyone else's permission or products to do so. Everyone's brain is unique thrown into a specific point in space and time and having traveled through a unique set of experiences and traumas, meditate on your brain. Have conversations with your beliefs. Some of them might be true, but many of them will be false. You are not stupid. You are not crazy. You have beautiful potential and you know it deep down inside. That's why you're listening to this podcast. I believe in you. I love you, you wild, magical, and lovable thing. Kamal Ravikant says, love yourself like your life depends on it. Oh, yes. Do that. You must. And I'll add to that. Believe in yourself like your life depends on it. Believe in the powers of your brain and the incredible loving connection between it and everything else. Thank you for listening. And if you want more episodes like this, please remember to like or subscribe or leave a review and also share it with friends if you think they might like it too brain brain brain
شامه